So I am Alexa Hamill. I am one of the associate directors for advising and programming. Um, in addition to doing individual advising um, for careers, I also do advising for most of the grad programs, including obviously law school. Um, I also oversee Barnard Connect, which is our awesome networking platform exclusively for Barnard students and alums. Um, and I oversee our mentors and residents program. So I'm very excited today to be having four awesome panelists all are currently or just recently graduated from law school so hopefully being able to hear a different voice and somebody who is in the shoes of hopefully what you guys are going to be feeling one day um, i know hearing from them about their perspective on law school both being a law school a law school student as well as actually applying and hearing directly from them i think and i hope it's going to be really helpful today um, so before we get started on questions, let's do some intros. Um, so Jenna, do you want to just start with your name, Barnard class year, Barnard major, law school, and law class year? Sure. The list of categories gets longer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Jenna Lauder, Barnard class of 2013. Um, I was a political science and human rights major and a French minor. Um, although don't ask me to speak French to you now. Um, and I'm at Columbia Law School now, class of 2021. Was that everything? Yes, great. <laughs> I feel like also it's harder as people go. I feel like when I'm ever the last person to introduce myself, I forget half of them. So okay. I'll remind anybody that forgets. All right, Ellie, you wanna go next? Sure, um, so I'm Ellie Williams. I use she, her pronouns. I graduated from Barnard in 2016 um, with a major in women's gender and sexuality studies. I did um, the i core concentration, so concentration race and ethnic studies, and I am a rising 3L uh, NYU Law. Okay, Sarah? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Levine. I use she, her pronouns. I graduated from Barnard in 2014. Um, I had majors in urban studies and political science, and I just graduated from you know, law school, graduation in quotes, because it was over Zoom, not because I haven't actually gotten my diploma. Thanks, Sarah. And Adar, am I pronouncing your name correctly, Adar? It's Adair. Yeah. Adair, okay, Adair. No one, no one knows. So I'm <laughs> okay. Adair, I'm Peter Ross. Um, Barnard class of 2014, like Sarah. Um, I had kind of an unconventional major because I was mostly an art history major and then I switched my senior year to um, African studies and human rights. And now I'm at Yale Law School class of 2021. Awesome, okay, good. So now that we got intros out of the way, let's to start with going over what your motivation was for applying to law school. So we can go back in the same order if we want to start with Jenna. Yeah, sure. So um, despite the fact that I was a political science major, I had no intention of going to law school when I was at Barnard. It's something that I became interested in um, when I was working. I worked for five years between undergrad and law school. Um, and I started working in government in Governor Cuomo's office. Um, and so I think for anyone who's interested in, you know, government, public policy, social change, which I expect some other people um, in this panel might be interested in as well. Um, you know, I think that understanding the law is really critical to being able to, you know, feel empowered to know what the changes are that you want to be advocating for. So that's sort of, you know, that type of more, um, technical knowledge of the structures that make up our society was really, you know, what brought me to apply to law school. Okay. Allie? Um, yeah, so I had some early inklings that I, part of it mostly just like stemming from family experiences. Um, so my dad was a lawyer and my mom was a Chicago police lieutenant. And so that led to some really, interesting conversations at home. Um, the added layer to that was like, you wouldn't know looking at me, but I'm biracial, so my dad's black, my mom's white. Um, and so yeah, I think like growing up, my family was constantly having really critical conversations about the way people of color experience the law, um, 
issues in policing and things like that. Like that was just kind of a constant dialogue growing up. And so that definitely sparked some early on interest. Um, and then a lot of my major really sort of pushed me towards the direction of law school. Um, I especially think in, in WGSS, you're really sort of looking at the historical and societal underpinnings to the way in which law inscribes difference um, and treats people so different based on certain social identities. Um, and so, yeah, I think my major really sort of did that sort of final push into thinking that law school was the right choice for me. Um, and then sort of from law school experiences, I was interning at Lambda Legal last summer. That has sort of developed for me personally, looking into LGBT um, legal work sort of in the long term for myself. Um, so yeah, so for me, it was a little bit of family. Barnard sort of <laughs> pushed me in that direction as well. Great, Sarah. Um, similarly, my uh, path to law school was pretty homegrown, and I think to a lot of people in my life, it seemed inevitable that I wound up at law school, even though it was totally unclear to me um, for a long time that that is where I would wind up. Um, I grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey, which is an aging, industrial, extremely diverse, but also extremely segregated city, and that has basically every problem that an aging American industrial city has. Um, so I was always really interested in questions about local policy and politics, distribution of resources, demographics, um, and studying urban studies and political science, I thought was like one way to look at the issues that I cared about, but I was really dissatisfied in undergrad with the social sciences as a way of advocating for the issues that I cared about. I just felt like every class that I took, while it was interesting and I loved my professors, was ultimately like read a bunch of studies, do a literature review and say who you agree with most. And that just wasn't using all of the parts of my brain that I wanted to advocate. Um, so I was really confused after graduating about what to do with the thing that I was passionate about, but also the set of tools that I had, which were pretty dissatisfying. And so I took a really circuitous path into law school. I worked as a data scientist for a bit because I thought that maybe doing something empirically or technically rigorous would use all of those parts of my brain that I wanted to. Um, and I wound up through that path doing a fellowship at Stanford Law School for two years where I was an in-house data scientist for faculty who were researching questions of law and policy, but using data science to help figure out how to make sense of the truth. Um, and during that time, I got to audit law school classes. And I knew that I wanted a graduate degree because most of the jobs that I wanted required some higher education. Um, but at the time, I was truly confused and agnostic about whether law school was the right uh, path forward or whether a public policy degree could get me where I wanted to go. I briefly considered an economics PhD. I wound up applying to all of those at the same time. Um, ultimately, I convinced myself that law school was the right path because compared to a public policy degree, it seemed meaninglessly different from the type of training that I got in undergrad. I liked that I would graduate with a career and not just a degree. Um, there was some trade off with the fact that law school is really expensive. Um, but I also really liked the way that lawyers were trained to think. I thought that the case method was really analytically rigorous. Um, I liked that when I was upset about something, there were a number of paths available to me. I, I could do more than write paper. I could start a lawsuit. I could start an advocacy campaign. I could work in government and try to affect change that way. Um, so ultimately, while everyone in my life was like, of course, you're a lawyer now, Sarah, um, that was what felt like a very nonlinear path into law school. Thanks. Adair? Sure. So I can actually relate to a lot of what Sarah said, especially the um, fact that everyone was like, yes, obviously you would become a lawyer. Um, but I think at, even in high school, I did mock trial and I was really interested in that and enjoyed it. And then in, at Barnard, I kind of drifted away from that and explored a lot of other topics. And I found myself getting really interested in sort of international work. Um, I did some projects abroad, I lived abroad, um, but I didn't really know how to shape that into a career. So after I graduated from Barnard, I went into consulting for um, three and a half years. And I hoped that working would help me sort of clarify what I wanted to do. And it didn't really, it gave me a lot of great skills, but it didn't like point me down a specific path. So I actually ended up applying mostly to international relations graduate programs. And then I threw a couple law schools in 
just because I figured, you know, it had always been in the back of my mind. So that would be sort of the time to see if I would get in anywhere. And then when I did, and it came down to deciding between those two programs, um, law school just felt like I could, I could go into international relations with a law degree, but I couldn't go into law with an international relations degree. So it just felt like the better choice. But I think I've been surprised in coming to law school that I feel like many or even most of my peers had a specific issue that they were really passionate about and law school was the only way for them to pursue that work whereas i feel like i came to it from the opposite perspective in that i think i have the skills to be a really good lawyer and i'm hoping that as i continue to work in the law i will find that like one niche topic that really drives me because right now I feel like my interests are quite broad but with a law degree I will be able to take those broad interests and broad skills and channel them wherever I end up. Great thank you. I have some follow-up questions I'm just writing down like as I'm, I'm hearing all these great points. So next question is so what factors were important to you when you were choosing law schools? And then ultimately, what led you to decide to attend the law school that you're currently attending or have attended? Let's go reverse order now. So let's start with a dare. Sure. So I feel like I actually don't have that much helpful to share here because I had mostly focused on international programs. I wanted to keep um, my law school list very small. And I felt like for me, because I wasn't going into the process being like, I have to become a lawyer, I have to go to law school. I felt like only, you know, a small handful of the top schools would be sort of in a big enough draw for me to decide to do that rather than the graduate, the international relations programs, which felt a little more what I had originally had in mind. So I actually just applied to um, the top four law school no i guess just the top three in the end um and so really for me it was like trying to because law school was going to be so much more expensive than the ir programs i wanted to make sure that i was sort of like getting the biggest bang for my buck so to speak um and then i didn't want to go to columbia because i wanted to just not be in morningside heights anymore so that's why i just got to those top three um but for me it was really the return on investment that i think stood out to me the most. I'm gonna give a similar, but I think potentially even more harsh and brutal and, and realist answer. And then I hope that Ellie and Jenna will walk it back a little bit and soften what I'm about to say. Um, but I think that when it comes to law school, it is a very different choice from the selection of undergrad. I think that in undergrad, we talk a lot about culture fit and finding a school that is going to allow you to grow. For me, those are so many reasons why I was drawn to Barnard. It was liberal arts. I loved the idea of going to a women's college. I loved the geography. I think when it comes to law school, almost all of those things are out of the window with very few exceptions that I'll discuss. Um, I think because law school is enormously expensive because the market for lawyers is both oversaturated um, and at the moment the economy is not great in terms of demand. If what you want is to be a practicing lawyer probably the thing that matters most is the rank of the law school that you go to. Um, I have friends who have graduated from exceptionally well-ranked law schools for whom it is difficult, not to say impossible, this is not to discourage you from going to law school, but for whom it is not a cakewalk to get the job that they want after they graduate. And I think especially if you want to do something in public interest or in government, um, other than just go for a firm, those jobs are really few and far between. Um, Unlike undergraduate admissions as well in law school, it is pretty linear and deterministic which schools are within range based on your GPA and your LSAT score. Unfortunately, that is not to say that things like extracurriculars, really strong recommendations, work in between undergrad and law school are not consequential. They really are. They can help move you um, kind of up and down the list of schools that you're in range for. But again, like it's pretty deterministic like what your range is based on those scores. Um, so all of that being said, when I was applying to law school, um, I wanted to get into the best law school that I could. I knew what my GPA was. Um, I only took the LSAT once and tried to get in range of the schools that I wanted to. I was a little bit disappointed with my LSAT score. I think that having some work experience after undergrad really helped. Um, and I will talk about that more later, but I'm, I'm a big advocate for taking a little bit of time between undergrad and law school. 
um, and having just recently finished a really demanding process of applying for public interest jobs and in particular fellowships, which are like a niche way of getting into public interest after you graduate. Um, I am really grateful that that is what I optimized for because it was not easy. Um, and I guess the last thing that I'll say is there are a few exceptions to this. Like the blanket rule that you should just go to the best school you get into is not always true. There are a few schools that really specialize in certain things, um, especially if you wanna do public interest work. NYU and Berkeley have amazing clinical programs, have amazing public interest programs. If you can get scholarship money to go somewhere, especially to do something you're interested in, that is important and I think can help make your decision. Um, but absent a few of those really particular exceptions, I think it's much more about rank, which is a bummer to be clear. I'm not, I'm not thrilled about that. Sure, so my, my sort of path was really <laughs> arduous to be completely honest. I kind of took the opposite approach in terms of like getting a select number of schools. So I knew what I was working with in terms of my GPA. I felt strong with the GPA, the test scores. I mean, I have just truly have never been a strong test taker. I would highly encourage anyone who is not super thrilled with their LSAT score to consider writing an addendum to sort of add some context to it. Um, so I knew very clearly like what I was working with and what I could sort of bring to the table for law school. As a result, I cast a very wide net. I definitely second the ranking, sort of prioritizing schools with higher rankings. Um, just for context for folks who might be like new to thinking about law school, there really are kind of two schools of thought. One is you go to the best school you can get into, you sort of take on the debt, hopefully of scholarships, things like that. Um, but you sort of default to the best school you can get into. And I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle, but also do very much align with that ideology because I, I do completely agree with, um, with Sarah, like there really is a tight correlation between your job opportunities and things like that and making it just easier to get a job. Like it is just true that like firms and legal organizations see the name of the school you went to and, and sort of make quick associations about you as a person. Second school of thought is you go wherever you get the most amount of money, um, but, and a lot of times if you're in that position, you have to work very hard to be on law review. You really want to be sort of top of your class so that when you enter the job market, you're really able to distinguish yourself and prove that, you know, you're a good fit for a job. Um, so yeah, so I sort of took both of those minds when I was applying, especially in light of the fact that I knew that my application process was going to be an uphill battle. Um, so I ended up applying to a ridiculous number. It's so embarrassing, I will not say. <laughs> uh, if we want to talk one-on-one -on -one about it, I'm more than happy to talk to people about it. But so for me, my first phase was much more about location. So I knew I was open to some schools in the South, but knew I didn't want to stay there long-term. So I was mostly looking Northeast. Um, I'm originally from Chicago, so looked at some Chicago schools and some West Coast schools. Um, but for me, it had a lot more to do with location, which is location is a lot more closely tied for law school than it is for undergrad um, in terms of like where you'll practice. Um, so that was sort of the first phase for me was location, but also casting a really wide net. And then for me, it was actually being a lot more critical about where I wanted to go once I was getting acceptances and, you know, like wait lists and things like that. Um, so once I got to sort of that second level and could really see what I was working with, I got into, got into NYU, which was my first choice. Um, and so for me, like, it was just kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> like, once I got in and I was, I was happy with the financial aid I got, um, it was just a clear choice. Like, I had other schools I could have waited out for, but just didn't have any interest in. For me, I didn't have to uproot my life in New York because I'd already been living here. Uh, my partner was here. So there are just so many factors that sort of contributed to New York being the perfect choice for me. Um, in terms of schools and sort of like what brought me to NYU more specifically um, was as someone who still at this point as a rising 3L is still sort of navigating the sort of area of the law that I want to pursue, but being very public interest minded and open to that sort of path further down the line, it was really important for me to go to a school that had public interest ethos really like centered in a lot of the courses. Um, because like I feel like law school is pretty inherently a pretty conservative place. I found that NYU 
sort of balanced like black letter law things you just kind of have to know but also with like a true compassionate human side of things um, I really do credit that to like our public interest law center having such a strong prevalence at the law school um, while the numbers sort of shake out we're like with any other school where most people do sort of go the private route, I really do feel like those perspectives of social justice sort of like pervade a lot of classes. And so that was really important to me was to not be in a classroom with a lot of <laughs> folks playing devil's advocate in a way that actively is harming other folks in the room. Um, so yeah, so for me, my the beginning of my process was really tough. <laughs> like I said, I'd, I'd truly happy, be more than happy to talk to people about that whole process. but. For me, once I got into NYU, it was just kind of done, easy process towards the end. Yeah, so um, I think I agree with what most of the rest of the panel has said, so I, you know, won't repeat everything. Um, but, you know, I, I would say for me, um, you know, I cast a medium-sized net. Um, for whatever it's worth, I took the LSAT twice. Um, the first time I just didn't get the score that I, I wanted. I took it a second time and my score went up by a lot. And so I also, I included an addendum to sort of explain the difference and hopefully that was helpful. Um, so definitely consider including that as part of your application. Um, and then in terms of selection, so yes, you know, I think uh, ranking is super important, unfortunately. Um, but I also think that, you know, there are different considerations for different people. So if you know that you want to work in a particular region and you don't necessarily just want to work in New York City, consider going to a law school in that region. Um, it's also helpful. And one of the reasons that I was happy to stay in New York, it's helpful that you can do term time internships depending on, you know, where you're physically located. Like I was able to intern in person at the Brennan Center for half of the year last semester, or for half of the semester. Um, so I guess this is all pre-COVID too. Um, and yeah, so that like really helps with networking and with job opportunities, hopefully um, afterwards. Um, and then the other thing that I don't think anyone mentioned is um, LRAP options. So if you are considering public interest, um, another thing that will make life easier for you is if you go to a school that has a good loan repayment assistance program, LRAP, um, and unfortunately, I think that the good LRAP programs probably also correlate with the ranking of the school. So the top schools usually offer the best loan forgiveness. Um, so you wind up kind of making the same choices that you would if you were going based on ranking alone. Uh, but it's definitely something to research and keep in mind. Um, and then also to Ellie's point about culture and, you know, public interest ethos. Um, I think I was also someone who came into law school absolutely knowing I wanted to do public interest. I was not at all interested in going the firm route um, in large part because I did work beforehand and like I was on a career path and law school is a means to an end, not an end unto itself. Um, and so I felt confident going to a school like Columbia that doesn't necessarily have the reputation of being a public interest school um, because, uh, you know, I felt like I wasn't going to get pushed off course um, by the prevailing culture and I was going to be able to seek out the opportunities that I wanted to take advantage of. Um, so, you know, to the extent that you feel like that describes you, I think actually there can be some benefit to going to a school that's not super focused on public interest, as long as they have like the resources and the offerings. Columbia obviously has amazing resources and you can do anything you want here really. Um, and you're just sort of competing against fewer public interest students for the same opportunities. Like I could get into whatever clinic I wanted to do and you know get whatever externship I wanted. And I wasn't competing against a million other students. Um, so yeah. I think that's it for me. Great, thank you. And sorry, my internet's like being a little funky. So you froze there for a sec, but I think we're good now. Um, okay, so now I want to move on to personal statements. So personal statements, I think for some applicants that can totally understand why, is a really difficult part of the application. Um, I think, and you know, I know it's weighed pretty heavily. So I want to focus on what your approach was when you were writing your personal statement. And I think specifically a problem that students find difficult is having kind of like what Adair was saying with like a really broad interest. 
um, and maybe not having such a focus going into it, how can you really make the case for a strong personal statement if maybe especially you're still figuring out what that focus is really going to be? So maybe, Jenna, if you want to start there. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. Um, so I, I, that resonates with me too. Um, I still feel like I'm figuring out what my narrow interests are. Um, you know, I, I said that I worked before law school and that definitely informed my general sense of direction, but I didn't go into law school with a very particular like area of the law that I wanted to study or issue area or community that I was necessarily focused on. Um, and so I framed my personal statement more along the lines of, you know, I care about doing a general type of work. You know, I care about working for positive social change, social justice, broadly um, and then focused my statement on all of the experiences that I have had so far in my life that I felt sort of prepared me to excel in law school and then as a public interest lawyer. Um, so, you know, talking about skill sets and values and, you know, grit and resilience and things like that, um, that are more sort of general personal qualities and can then be applied to whatever it is you want to do. I think, um, you know, certainly if you have a really strong demonstrated interest in one area, that can be compelling and intriguing to a school. But I also think so many students come in thinking they want to do one thing and then wind up doing another, or generally just they think they want to do public interest and then they wind up going to a firm as we see happen all the time. So, um, you know, I think schools don't necessarily expect you to have it all figured out. Um, the other thing I would say with regard to writing your personal statement is um, I think I, I sort of learned my lesson in undergrad where I was not really 100% focused on the college application process and I kind of took some other people's advice and put together a personal statement that wasn't like really the strongest reflection of who I was um, and, and so didn't feel like really confident about it. And so for law school, the thing that was really important to me was that my personal statement was as genuine a reflection of who I felt that I was, what I wanted to express to people. Um, yes, I tried to be strategic and of course present myself in a positive light, but if I was going to be rejected, I wanted it to be on the basis of, you know, uh, of a statement that I felt really rang true. Um, and so I think that you know, if you listen to your gut and, and try to be honest about who you are, that's going to really resonate with admissions officers. Um, I totally second what Jenna was saying about if you aren't specifically sure, like, what area of the law you want to go into, which is, like, for sure how I was when I was applying. Like, I really, I was very public interest minded, but wasn't sort of sure, like, what area that would be. Um, and agree, completely agree, like I'm still at that point where I'm still trying to figure it all out. Um, and so, yeah, I think speaking more towards the skill set and general interest is perfectly fine. Um, because the reality is that like in undergrad, between working and undergrad, you're just not going to be exposed to certain areas of the law until you are there. Like I highly doubt that you're taking a copyright class <laughs> in undergrad. It might come up in other ways, but like there's so many areas that you really don't know until you're there. So I really think like not necessarily having a niche is perfectly fine. Um, so I definitely second all of um, what Jenna said on that part. In terms of like the writing process, I would highly recommend that you sort of amongst your friends and family who are writers, copywriters, um, who have who know you very well um sort of creating your own little like workshop team i found that to be most helpful like obviously you don't want too much involvement from outside parties but i me my really close friend at barnard who was an english major um my fiance who did a lot of copywriting like i had my little dream team <laughs> who i would like workshop with and it was very helpful for them to be like, well, that doesn't really sound like you. Like, that's weird. This phrasing is cheesy and could be much more effective. Like, I think having your team of people who know you very well and also are good writers themselves, um, to me, that was invaluable. That, like, really sort of kept me accountable to say, okay, on Friday evening, we're going to 
read through my statement and we're going to sort of like think through language and how to convey what I want to convey. Um, so I would highly recommend that you like sort of think through your friends and have a team to sort of like help you to some degree. Um, gosh, I had another point <laughs> that I was going to make about the personal statement um, and I lost it. Um, so yeah, I'll, if I, if I get it back, I will bring it up later, but yeah, that's about it. Jump in after me if it comes back to you. Um, I, I could not agree more thoroughly with what Jenna and Ellie have said so far. I think especially Ellie's point about having a privy council to kind of check in with periodically about your writing is totally essential. Um, the few additional things, I think that the task in a personal statement, and I struggled for a long time just being like, what am I trying to accomplish here? I think the task is to convince the admissions committee that you have thought critically about your experiences thus far and why you actually know law school is the thing that you want to do next. And so for me, someone who looking at my resume, I have all of these disparate experiences. I've worked in technology, I've worked in government, I've worked in nonprofit, I've worked in academic research. The job in front of me was how do I draw a line between all of these points and come up with some sort of narrative arc about how I reflect on all of the different experiences I have had and what the heck that has to do with law school. And so for me, you know, I, I think I could very persuasively say I've now sat in on law school classes, so I understand what legal training looks like and why that is what I want. I think for some of you that might be reflecting more on the areas that you want to make an impact in and describing why a law degree is going to give you the tools that you need to be an advocate in that area. Um, so I think that another way if you're kind of caught up in, oh, well, you know, if I don't know exactly what the substantive cause that I care so much about is, is how do I convince myself, uh, how do I convince a panel of admissions people that law school is the right step for me? Think more about the training that you'll get in law school and why that's going to help you be successful um, in terms of whatever is important to you. Um, the next thing that I want to say is, yeah, there's, there's something contrived about this. And I think it's important to be honest with yourself about the fact that this is a weird exercise. You cannot reduce your humanity and all of your interests and experiences to a coherent narrative two-page statement. Um, so whatever you say, whatever the big thing that like you have realized about your past experiences or whatever your motivation is going to law school, no one's going to hold you to that. The way that I made sense of my experiences in writing my personal statement was, well, gee, I really care about local policy and politics, and I've been working as a technologist for a while, and I know I care about policy. Maybe, like, technology policy is something that I could work on. No one has asked me since I was admitted to law school if I actually intend to commit myself to a career in technology policy, because I don't. I've decided I want to become a labor and employment lawyer, so I've, like, totally pivoted. Um, that's the next thing I want to say. The last thing that I want to say, Alexa may, may uh, preempt me from doing this, but I, over the past couple of years, have asked my friends who are my classmates at Yale Law School if they would be willing to share their admissions materials with me, exactly because when I was applying to law school, I was just so confused about what a personal statement looked like. You read their websites, and it's like, write anything, two pages, share your feelings. And I was like, that, that can't be right. Like, there has to be some kind of formula. There has to be some kind of good example of this. And reading the like books you can check out from the library that are like 50 personal statements, they all just seemed like they were written by people who had done impossible things. They just like didn't look like me at all in terms of my CV or experiences. So I have a Google Drive folder that is full of example law school applications. It's not a ton. It's like maybe I have like 20 personal statements and like a, some resumes and some like other diversity statements and stuff like that. Um, but they're all written by my friends who are all really smart, but also just like normal people. Like, that none of them have like started nonprofits or like you know solved the world hunger or anything. Um, and so if that is helpful to anyone here, and if Alexa gives me the thumbs up, I would be happy to drop that link in the chat. Yeah, definitely. No, I mean I'm all for, and I think that having as like part of the committee, I always say having somebody who's currently in law school or a recent graduate, I think is amazing because they're successful. They, what, the tools that they use got them to where hopefully you want to be. So I think that the only time I'm ever like a little weary of it, and I think it could be for anything, cover letters, personal statements, is knowing that it's not necessarily, you know, their um, reasoning is like the golden reason, the only reason. I think kind of what probably Sarah is saying, and I think a lot of others would agree is, um, you're right, like you don't need to, you know, solve world hunger in order to be a successful applicant. But I think knowing that balance of how can I explain myself well in a way that fits with my diverse experiences. And I think if it's less about 
let me try to also do that exact thing and more so how in a cohesive way can I relate this to my interests for law school and my previous background. I think that's awesome and I'm totally for incorporating that as like part of the process. So I think that's really helpful for you to include Sarah. So Adair. Sure, so um, I, first of all, will say that my own personal statement, I also didn't have a very clear idea of what I wanted to do. It was more about working internationally. So I echo the other panelists in that that can be, that can work. Um, that being said, since I've been in law school, I've been doing sort of freelance essay coaching for people applying to law school. And I feel like that has actually given me more insight into what works and what doesn't. So one tip that I would say is that like, the people who are reviewing your application, they already have your resume in front of them. So I think you want to be strategic because I think it's a mistake to put, to try to fit everything that's in your resume or even a majority of what's in your resume into an essay because it's impossible to do that without a clear thesis statement. Um, I would echo what other people have said in that ultimately that thesis statement if not explicit, should at least implicitly be that law school is the logical next step for you. You don't need to say that outright, but the person should put down your essay and be like, oh, this person needs to go to law school. So that is like at base what your task is. I think a very simple formula that you can adapt, but that works really well is to pick two experiences that you've had that at first blush seem contradictory and to talk about the first one in the first paragraph talk about the second one in the second paragraph and then the third paragraph should be you demonstrating how you've reflected on those experiences and seen that actually they are uniquely compatible or compelling or unique and that should feed into why you want to go to law school. So I pick, I try to describe it as like paragraph one is yellow, paragraph two is blue, and then the essay, the rest of the essay should show how they come together to make green. So this also connects to Sarah's point, which is no one will care what you say in your essay once you get in. But if you can take that yellow and blue and turn it into a green, that at least sounds like a plausible legal interest or future legal career like i do think your essay is that much stronger for it and it's absolutely not anything that you will be tied to um but it just it goes back to thinking through like what if they've seen your resume if they've seen your test scores if they've seen everything else how do you want them to remember you so if you know in 30 minutes the committee is like who was a dare again you want them to be like oh, that girl who did that thing in South Africa, you know, you want them to have like that one thing. And the essay, I think, is where you can really develop that thing. It doesn't necessarily need to be a legal thing, but it should at least be like adjacent to a legal thing so that they remember you and they can also like understand who you are at a deeper level. And then I guess the last thing I would add is that you definitely should have people for proofreading your essay. And I would also say that the people who read your essays for you, you should ask them afterwards, like, what would you say the takeaway here is? Or like, call them a couple days later and be like, what did you think my essay was about? And if they can't like identify the central theme or the central message that you thought you were conveying, like, you need to go back to it because almost everyone adds too much detail and too little thesis when they're writing. And so like that other person or that other committee can help you pare down your essay to be very crisp. Um, I think sometimes people think they're being too obvious, but for someone who doesn't know you, like you, it's, ra it's better to be explicit than to like leave things unsaid that could help your case. Wow, I think those are all really great points. And I'm gonna start asking the student to ask me what I think the takeaway is, because I think that's a great point is, you know, sometimes you could think you're being super clear and how can they not know, like, this is about me, but we don't know you and we don't know that why. So I think that's a great point. 
All right, well, I did have a couple more questions, but I know that you guys probably have some questions for them, so I don't want to take up too much more time. If you do have questions, if you can just unmute yourself, if you wanted to put the videos on too, that would be great. If you guys don't have questions, I'm also happy to go on, but let's just pause here for a second. Hi, so thank you guys for coming today. It's been really helpful. My question is, so obviously for college, I had a college advisor that I really went for who kind of helped me with, you know, my scores and what schools would be a good fit. So who did you guys go to for this advising inside and outside of the Barnard community? I can start you guys want. Um, so I fortunately, you know, I had friends who had gone through the law school application process a year or two before me. So they were a really great place to start. Um, and one of them actually recommended like a consulting, you know, admissions consulting thing. And she recommended it so highly. So I tried it out and it was like really expensive and like, you know, if you want to throw a few thousand dollars down the drain and have somebody who like reminds you to do the stuff that you need to do, then great. But otherwise, like, I don't necessarily think that you need any kind of like formal advising like that. Um, it's more of like a security blanket, if anything. Um, I think that there are a lot of really great online resources, like there are blogs, above the law, you know, there are blogs that talk about the admissions process um, about different law schools. Friends, as I said, Barnard obviously has an amazing support network. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's necessarily a magic to it. Um, as people have mentioned previously, like it's sort of like, I think there are like even charts of that match your GPA and your LSAT score and like can project the range of schools that you would be competitive for. So it's, yeah, it's not like a secret sauce really, I don't think. I agree that there is no secret sauce. I think that however many years ago it was that I graduated, either because I wasn't paying attention to the Barnard specific resources that existed because I didn't know I would be going to law school or because I do think the, the Barnard um, kind of pre-law program has really been built out and has become more robust in the past few years. Barnard was not really my source for motivation and for information during the law school process. Um, I moved to the West Coast right after I graduated and I, did something that was extremely uncomfortable for me at the time, but I think really worthwhile in that I just looked up Barnard alumni on LinkedIn who had jobs that I thought were cool and just like asked them if they would hang out with me. I didn't have friends. I didn't have a job at the time. So I was like, I'll come meet you for lunch literally any day. Um, and I learned an enormous amount during that period about one, just how to network and how to meet people. Um, two, jobs that I thought were interesting, jobs that I didn't think were interesting. And that was really helpful on the back end when I was narrowing down which graduate programs to apply to. Like I looked at the careers of women who I thought were really successful and interesting and jobs that I wanted, looked at their resume and was like, oh, they all went to law school. Um, so I would encourage all of you to knock on as many doors as possible. And whenever you see someone who has a job that is interesting to you, cold email them. And if like you want an example of what a cold email looks like, I would be happy to forward one to you. I think every person on this panel is like the path of least resistance, people you should start talking to. I am more than happy to put my Gmail account in the chat and talk to anyone who is thinking of applying to law school. So I have found that Barnard alumni in particular are super willing to make time and talk about this stuff. Um, but the onus is also on you to reach out because I did not find that any formal mentorship program existed in a way that was useful to me. I can jump in. I think I have two conflicting insights here. The first being that like, I don't know why I just decided I was going to apply to law school and figured that that was something that I would just kind of do myself the way that I applied to college. So. I didn't really like read any of the blogs and I just kind of looked online and saw what the schools asked for and tried to put it together. So on one hand, I think that was kind of a good approach because it meant that like my application, as Jenna was saying, was 
very true to who I am. It was not like a product of tinkering or strategy, really. It was kind of just a brute force effort on my part. Um, the flip side of that is, though, that like having now been to law school and talked to other people, you know, I didn't have any, I don't have any lawyers in my family. Like I can now see in retrospect, I was kind of flying blind in a lot of ways. Like for example, I didn't know that the LSAT only happened four times a year. And I decided in October that I was going to apply to law school. And then basically just like only studied the LSATs for two months straight to take them in December. Like I didn't realize that admissions were rolling until I was applying like right at the January deadline. So it's like, I could have done a lot of things better, but you also, again, like don't necessarily need those resources. I would say I didn't really access any Barnard sort of like pre-law advising, but what I did do is I reached back out to my professors and also a dean that I was really close to. Um, he's no longer at Barnard, but at the time he had been the person who worked with you on like scholarship. So I had, you know, like, or fellowships, or I had gotten to know him while I was at Barnard. And I was really concerned four years after I graduated that professors wouldn't remember me or this dean wouldn't make the time to write me a letter of recommendation. And that was absolutely not the case. You know, I had, he read drafts of my essays, my professors all immediately turned around letters of recommendation. Um, and so I actually felt really supported by Barnard in that way. So just to say, if you're not considering going to law school right away, and as other people have mentioned, I actually really recommend taking a few years off from work. I'd say just, you know, shoot your professors an email once a year, letting them know what you're up to. And then when it comes time for the letters of recommendation, like don't be shy in asking. People can always say no, but in my experience, people were thrilled to help me out. And it even like reconnected me to some of the professors that I had really loved during my time at Barnard. So don't think that like, if it's been a few years or you don't want to go to law school right away, you're like closing down those connections because in my experience, that was not at all the case. Yeah, I guess I would just add like, I, I tried to use Barnard resources as much as possible. I, and I do think a lot of it just has to do with like when, like it being several years ago, like there just wasn't a ton of structure to the advising process. Like everything just kind of fell all over the place. And it, and it seems as though with Beyond Barnard, it really like unifies that process. So like, I definitely encourage you to use Barnard resources. I personally didn't find them particularly helpful sort of throughout the process, but you know, that being said, like a symptom of just graduate, like applying to any grad program is going to be kind of a unique individual experience in the sense that college is very unified. Almost all of the colleges, you know, release decisions around the same time, the enrollment deadlines are pretty unified. It's like not at all really like that in law school. Like there's some unification in the sense of like the tests you have to take, but because it's rolling, you know, law schools can admit you at any point in time. Other schools, you might be waiting. Like there was, I had already committed to NYU and I was still waiting to hear from like two or three schools. So it really is kind of a mess. And like, you kind of have to be a little comfortable with the discomfort of like not knowing what your process is going to look like. Um, I definitely second what Sarah was saying about reaching out to people and sort of like finding mentors. Um, because yeah, like I, I think like talking to other people who had gone through the process was most helpful um, because they have that sense of like timing of things and so sort of like general tips of, you know, how to strategize your application and things like that. So I would highly encourage you to reach out to people who've gone through this process more recently um, because there's just so much insight from like going through the logistical process of applying. Um, just just kind of like another note though too on the topic of letters of recommendation I would highly recommend that if you even mostly think you'll eventually go to law school you can actually like touch base with your professors very early on like right around graduation season and ask them if they would be willing to write a letter for you because um, I had I had some difficulty with one professor who unfortunately I have like multiple classes with her and like she was not really helpful when it came to the application process 
Um, fortunately, I had other professors who I was able to like work with. Um, but it was because I had asked them like right when I graduated, would they write a letter for me? And so I was able to hold on to that letter for a while. Like I think the LSAC system holds on to letters of recommendation for like up to five years. So if you can think prospectively and know that you're going to take some time, I would highly encourage planting those seeds early because when I went back, like I had one professor, like I said, who was awesome and was super supportive and one professor who like did not really care about my process. <laughs> um, and like, I mean, I ultimately didn't even ask. I asked for the letter, but like didn't really follow through just because it was not particularly encouraging. Um, so yeah, I think the sooner you can sort of get your ducks in a line and make those requests earlier, they'll be happy for it as well. Great, thank you guys. Good, so I know we're coming up to one o'clock, so some of the panelists do have a hard stop at one because they're working today. So if at any point you guys need to log off, feel free, thank you so much. Um, well, we will have time for one more quick question, and I think Julia has had her virtual hand up, so if you want to ask your question, and just to point out, um, all of the panelists have included their emails in the chat, which is so great and really helpful, so thank you guys. So I know we didn't have a lot of time for Q&A, so you can feel free to reach out after. So Julia, if you want to ask your question. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm an international student at Barnard and I'm considering pursuing a career in international law. Um, and I was wondering if there are any programs that you might recommend in international law. And also, I don't know, you probably aren't international students, but I was wondering if you have any perspective on how international students, um, like the experiences of international students in your current um, colleges, uh, universities. Thank you. Okay, I feel like I should answer this because I talked about international law, but I feel a little under equipped, mostly because in coming to law school, I've realized that like international law isn't really a field as such. There are so many sort of subfields that are very different. Like there's international human rights law, there's like arbitration, which can have an international component. Um, I think at least in the short term, I will be working for a firm in transactional law. And part of why I decided to go the transactional route is it seems to have more opportunities for cross border work than litigation. Um, so, and then there's also like national security. There are like a lot of different aspects that can be termed international. So I didn't necessarily look into that before I applied, but I would say, you know, any school that you're looking at, if you just Google their name and then like international law, like I think Yale has some sort of international law program and like I'm on their mailing list and those send out opportunities. Um, another thing to look for is if, um, if schools offer any sort of funding for you to do summer internships that are unpaid, it's good to look into whether or not you can use that funding internationally. Um, last summer I interned for an organization in Myanmar and so that was like a really interesting experience. I didn't even end up doing that much legal work but it certainly gave me sort of more credibility to go into job interviews and say like I have experience working abroad so I would like to continue doing that in the future. Um, but I think really the first step is getting into looking into what you want to do with the international perspective. I found personally that a lot of what's called international law, dealing with like the UN and things like that, it actually doesn't appeal to me because it feels very ineffective to me. And so I've come to realize that I'm more interested in being in other countries and working on projects there than sort of this idea of international law that's like floating around in the air above all of us. Um, but that's like sort of a personal thing for each of you to figure out. In terms of being an international student, um, I'm not entirely sure about this, but I would think that firms themselves would be good options for employers that would sponsor you after you graduate. I don't think that's necessarily true for more public interest 
positions just because it can be very expensive to sponsor someone. So I would maybe look at a variety of different positions that you might be interested in and do a little digging to see if they have international people on their payroll, things like that, because I know a lot of my international friends, law school or not, find it very difficult to get sponsored after they graduate. So if you really want to stay in the US, I think that's something you want to plan for. If you're agnostic about where you are, you could look into law programs in your home country and then come to the US and do just a master's, the, an LLM program to sort of supplement that and then be able to work in the US. Um, but I would say start planning ahead for the visa issues um, because it's not sort of a given that once you graduate from law school, you'll be able to find sponsorship. But anyone, feel free to <laughs> disagree with anything I just said. Yeah, I guess my, my only thing to add to that um, would, I guess, be like kind of just general advice. Um, in terms of sort of the more curricular pieces, um, if you're looking at law schools, I would advise that you look at schools that have some sort of an elective, um, either in the second semester or in the first semester. Um, so your 1L year is very rigid in the sense of that, like being the same, like six classes. Um, that is important is to, if you are looking to do some type of international law, this significant leg up if you've taken international law as sort of like a, just an elective year 1L. Um, the reason why I've heard that is so NYU has international law as an elective. And so for a while when that wasn't as an elective, it's really hard for students to get those international law internships between those two years um, because those orgs tend to have such a strong preference for someone who at least has some background in that work. Um, so as you're looking at law schools, I would just recommend that you ensure that like you're looking at schools that have that as a course offering um, within that you know second semester usually. Um, the other thing too and like this is something that like everyone really should be doing when they're looking at law schools is like look at the student associations and um, organizations. So at law school, and then there are quite a breadth of affinity-based organizations, um, sort of endearingly at NYU, I think a lot of schools, they sort of refer to the collective as also groups. Um, so I would be mindful, like, is there an international student association, national law, sort of more generally, like looking at sort of those student organizations to see where the school is literally putting in a monetary investment towards those students and this area of academic interest. Because if you're seeing the absence of that, you just want to be mindful of like, what, what is that going to be as a student sort of for you personally? And also is the school investing in the area that you want to be studying in? Um, so I would be picking up cues from what are the student organizations and sort of extracurricular offerings will here, do you have anything to add? No. Okay. Okay. Amazing. I don't want to cut you off. All right. Well, we are running a couple minutes over, so I don't want to keep everyone again for the panel. This was super helpful. I learned a lot too. So thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you to all the students and alums who are here. If you have questions, you have my email, so feel free to reach out. You have the panelist's email as well. So thank you guys again. Have a good day. Bye, guys. Yeah.